Hey y'all, it's Webcam Parrot here to talk about Etrigan once again. And this time, I'm going to be going over what is probably his most well-known and most iconic comic, uh, Etrigan Volume 3, as well as several other comics that came out around the same time. Starting with Detective Comics 603 from 1989, where he would face off against a tulpa made of violence, hatred, and revenge, and would, using his hellfire, completely annihilate it, calling his hellfire an embodiment of all the hatred of hell. And at the end of the comic, he also gives Batman, who had been helping him, a nice kiss. In Action Comics Weekly, 638 to 641, from 1989, we see Jason and Etrigan in yet another fight, somehow separated from each other in a way that was never really explained. At the climax of the argument, Etrigan simply fades away. At the same time, we see Astaroth torturing Merlin, and then sending out a shared vision to Jason and his friends, telling them to meet him at a certain location. Unaware who exactly has sent this vision, they all feel as if they are being drawn to this location. As they get closer to this destination, they stumble upon a group of people performing a ritual to free Morgan Le Fay, who if you remember, was sealed in stone previously. Not far behind them is Etrigan, who arrives to combat Morgan Le Fay. Le Fay, now freed from the stone, is able to restrain Etrigan, but becomes distracted by Jason blood and is then melted by Etrigan's hellfire. We see that the demon lord Astaroth has been observing all of this as it happens, and seems to cry out in pain with Morgan Le Fay as if they share some kind of connection. After defeating Morgan Le Fay, Etrigan is able to detect that she was being powered by a source that came from Hell, the demon lord Astaroth. Jason asks why Astaroth would want to do this, and Etrigan says that not even Satan himself could read the mad demon lord Astaroth. Etrigan also realizes that Astaroth is planning a reunion between all of them in Hell. At the same time, Glenda and Randu are shown a vision of Etrigan torturing Jason in Hell, which was also sent by Astaroth. After hearing this, Jason Blood prepares a spell that teleports him to Hell, and we see that Astaroth is waiting for them with his altar ready to sacrifice everyone. This storyline would be continued in The Demon Volume 3, 1990-1994, where it cuts to them already having escaped from Astaroth, and we see Merlin explaining exactly what happened. Merlin explains that if Astaroth had succeeded, all of Hell would have been thrown into turmoil. We get a flashback to the ritual that Astaroth was attempting to perform, which had each of the group tied down and restrained to some strange pentagram ritual table. Merlin is able to use the last vestiges of his power to free Etrigan, who releases Jason and the others, and escapes with the group. It's also worth noting that Astaroth believed that with a combination of Merlin's and Etrigan's powers, he would have been able to overthrow the entire triumvirate, including Lucifer, Belial, and Beelzebub. We also see him use some of the power he has already taken from Merlin to destroy the Philosopher's Stone, which on its own is an incredibly powerful artifact. However, his plans were foiled when Merlin and the others escaped, and he was left almost entirely powerless and at the mercy of the other demons. Whilst Etrigan and Jason are still in Hell, the demon goes to visit his mother Ran Vadar. Etrigan tells his mother that he wants to rule Hell and that he despises Jason. It's also noted that Etrigan has always enjoyed pain, even when he was just a baby, not even screaming once whilst he was branded. His mother agrees to help him, and Etrigan goes to amass his army. In the meantime, we see Merlin is observing Astaroth's defeat at the hands of Morax, who now wields his power. Merlin is still concerned, however, 
As now that Etrigan is loose in Hell, not even the unholy triumvirate of Lucifer, Belial, and Beelzebub are safe, as Etrigan has reason to hate all of them. Merlin tries to contact his father Belial and warn him of this, but Belial just blows him off, not seeming to be concerned about Etrigan at all. The wizard claims that even the delicate balance that Chaos needs to survive is under threat thanks to Etrigan. Belial responds that Merlin was made to deal with him so he should handle Etrigan, but unfortunately the wizard is still depowered thanks to prior events with Astaroth. Etrigan approaches his father Belial and tries to convince him to join his side, arguing that with the two of them, he wouldn't have to constantly contend with Lucifer and Beelzebub in his rule, just Etrigan. Belial seems swayed and agrees, but secretly plans to just join whichever side seems to be winning. Merlin tries to warn Lucifer of Etrigan's plans, but he doesn't seem to care at all, simply saying that change is inevitable and it can also be interesting. In his attempt to accrue allies, Etrigan would go to fight Abaddon, the guardian of Masak Mavdil, the lowest and worst point of hell. He eventually defeats this guardian, despite its rumoured massive power, and converts it over to his side using some strange power that's never explained, presumably mind control. Etrigan pays a visit to his brother, Merlin, beating the absolute tar out of him, and there he finds his friend Harry that was previously captured by Belial, only now he is a pillow, which he was turned into because Belial likes a good cushion. Etrigan and his army begin to approach Beelzebub's domain, and as they do so, he combines his powers with Abaddon's, blowing a hole into Beelzebub's throne room. Once inside, Etrigan easily defeats the Lord of Flies in a single attack. Lucifer is once again informed of this, but still does not seem concerned at all, despite how easily Beelzebub was defeated. Etrigan storms Lucifer's tower, walking straight up into his throne room, only for the Lightbringer to immediately surrender, basically just saying, why not? And it seems like Etrigan burns him horribly with his hellfire in response, although admittedly, the perspective of the scan is a little weird, and Lucifer is completely fine later, so I'm not really sure. Etrigan, now the king, finally has the right to wear the crown of horns, which he immediately puts on, claiming that they can now storm the gates of heaven. Belial is angry at Etrigan, simply declaring himself king, saying that there are two of them and that they had a deal. However, Etrigan calls him out, asking if the Lord of Deceit, Belial never lies. If Lucifer had stood and fought, which side would he have joined? Belial blasts Etrigan, which proves to be completely ineffective, as Sun turns his own power on Father in a gout of hellfire. Etrigan quickly wins their fight, partly thanks to the power of the crown, and easily tears his father's heart right out of his chest, which funnily enough doesn't even seem to kill him. Presumably, Etrigan could also survive having his heart torn out, which is something we'll see later. The new King of Hell begins his reign by throwing the old rulers into Hell's deepest pit, starting with Belial and Beelzebub, and finally turning on Lucifer. Uncaring as ever though, the Morning Star simply breaks his bonds, telling Etrigan that he is disappointed in him before flying away as Etrigan tries in vain to burn him from behind. Etrigan eventually hunts down Merlin and begins torturing him for a release from his cursed connection to Jason Blood. Eventually Merlin relents and releases the spell unbinding the demon from Jason. Etrigan is delighted and begins taunting both Jason and Merlin, only for Jason to muster a brief moment of strength, punching Etrigan square in the face and taking the crown from him. Bear in mind that Jason is not a normal human in Hell. He is an archetypal soul like everything else there, and as a wizard, should have a particularly powerful soul as well. Jason puts on the crown, becoming King of the Damned, and the two begin fighting. However, even with the crown, Jason is not powerful enough to defeat Etrigan, and can only temporarily clash with him. Merlin, however, reveals 
that he lied about ending his binding spell, and after speaking the poem, Etrigan is sucked back into Jason, binding them together once again. Clarion shows up again after years, and we see him talking to Harry the Pillow. Clarion says that he still holds a grudge against Etrigan for sending him to the Beyond region last time they fought, and will get his revenge. After this, Etrigan is approached by the Phantom Stranger, who claims that he only wants to talk, but the demon just immediately turns on the Hellfire. The Phantom Stranger starts to tell him that it's futile, as he cannot harm him, as his powers come from a greater being by far than Etrigan, only for the Phantom Stranger's body to be completely annihilated in an explosion of Hellfire anyway. The Phantom Stranger regenerates, animating a statue to restrain Etrigan, saying that he is a far higher power, but the demon easily breaks out of it despite this boast. The Phantom Stranger tells Etrigan that not just the world is in danger, but hell and all else as well. Etrigan is still being an ass though, so the Stranger casts a spell, making him swap back with Jason once again. Later, Lobo arrives on Earth, where himself and Etrigan have a long extended battle with both of them simply regenerating all of their injuries. Lobo claims to know that Etrigan has a weak point, as one of his many skills is to detect the weakness of his opponents, but can't seem to find Etrigan's. They decide to call off the fight, and Lobo explains that he was hired to destroy the Earth, and Etrigan decides to help him. Lobo says that to destroy the Earth, he is going to drop a hydrogen bomb at a very specific location and Etrigan gets a telepathic call from Randu, who tells him he needs to go to Gotham as there is a missile base there where they can get the bomb. Etrigan and Lobo head to the missile base, but run into some resistance there in the form of Clarion and Sith the Undying. Lobo gets his absolute ass handed to him by the duo and asks them to leave him alone as they are after Etrigan, not him, with both of them agreeing giving Lobo the chance to finish his mission. Etrigan seems to be doing better against them, but as he is about to strike them down, he is attacked by a Tulpa that Clarion has prepared in advance. The Phantom Stranger tries to persuade Lobo to stop his attempts to destroy the Earth. The Stranger is prevented from interfering directly, however, as he states that it is the Earth's destiny to be destroyed, but Lobo decides to continue anyway. Clarion uses Sith the Undying's bone to create a portal to stop the hydrogen bomb from exploding, preventing the Earth's destruction despite the Phantom Stranger's prophecy. However, Etrigan is nowhere to be seen. It's revealed that Etrigan was sent to the Beyond Realm by Clarion's spell, which is stated to be a place from which no one can return from, not Demon nor Lord of Hell, only those with virtue may leave. Whilst Etrigan is there, he meets the Thing that cannot die, who tells Etrigan that the place they are trapped in is where Merlin exiled all of his bad magics. Whilst this is happening, an event known as War of the Gods is occurring, and Wonder Woman is killed by Cersei, which Clarion seems to take notice of, and so he decides on a whim to send Wonder Woman to the Beyond Realm instead of the Afterlife. She coincidentally lands in the exact same spot as Etrigan, where we see the demon is being tortured by some strange Beyond Realm being. Wonder Woman sees this creature and attempts to strike it down, but it defeats her with no trouble at all. However, at the sight of her, Etrigan falls in love and breaks his bonds, jumping to her aid. Etrigan casually one-shots this Beyonder and attempts to make his move on Wonder Woman, who does not seem pleased at all about his advances. Diana tries to fight back, but it's stated that despite her strength and speed, she stands no chance at all against Etrigan, and so speaks the poem to turn him back into Jason instead. Diana immediately leaves after this, and Etrigan is made victim to a special ritual in the Beyond Zone known as the Wild Hunt, but he is saved at the last minute by his brother, Scapegoat. It's worth noting at this time that Etrigan and Jason's personalities were swapped, and so he does not remember Scapegoat at all. Wonder Woman is able to escape the Beyond Realm 
thanks to her great virtue, which the thing who, that cannot die is able to track, allowing them to follow it to the Beyond Realm's exit, where they find the Golden Knight guarding it. Etrigan tries to fight the Golden Knight, but as their personalities are switched, Jason doesn't have enough experience using his body, and so ultimately loses to his power of truth. They switch, however, Etrigan's personality now in Jason's body, who is able to defeat the Golden Knight thanks to a sneak attack and pushing him off the edge of the Beyond Realm. After defeating the Golden Knight, Etrigan is able to make his way to the portal out, which looks like the iris of some great occult eye. After jumping through the eye, Jason and Etrigan are separated, each in their own bodies, and they find themselves in some giant labyrinth. Lobo is also there, and he and Etrigan begin to fight. Jason and Etrigan team up on Lobo, and the demon is able to badly fry and defeat him with his hellfire. However, as Lobo is defeated, it is revealed that it was nothing but a magical clone, with Etrigan saying that the powers they face here are very similar to his own, implying he could also make a Lobo clone like this. After traversing more of the labyrinth, the two encounter a grotesque beast known as the Lurker. The Lurker claims that he was created by Merlin in the moment that man and demon were fused together. He is neither of them, but is also a child of both. Since then, the Lurker has existed privy to all of their thoughts and experiences, but unable to affect or communicate anything. That changed when they entered the Beyond Realm, and he was able to assert himself thanks to the energies of the Dimension Flux trapping both of them in his own dual mind. Now he will use their bodies as his own out in the real world, and they will be able to do nothing but watch. Of course, neither Jason nor Etrigan are happy about this, but can do little to stop him from torturing them. Until, Jason points out that none of what's happening is real. It's just their own magic turned against them, and to get out, they must truly believe that they are not there, as they only think that they are there. This eventually works, and they successfully unbelieve the Lurker, escaping the labyrinth and returning home, where Etrigan and Jason agree to change their relationship, making it more of a partnership than a rivalry. In the next storyline, we see a bunch of politicians discussing the future of America, when Darren W. Dingle III says that they need to put a real conservative in the White House, and that this should be decided by a computer to pick the perfect political candidate. They are looking for someone with a drastic economic recovery plan, a commanding physical presence, a winning smile, a deep speaking voice, a good communication with lyrical speech patterns, tall and well built, gives straight answers and promises simple answers to complex problems, a fiscal conservative who's tough on crime and has a firm handshake. He'll need to have warm eyes, can't be afraid to take the heat, and someone that can't be bullied by special interest groups. This, of course, describes none other than our boy in yellow, Etrigan, which is exactly who the computer picks, and so they decide that he must be the one. Finally, a real conservative. Etrigan is delighted by this, as it will give him plenty of opportunities for mischief. Etrigan's campaign for presidency is going really well, partly thanks to his number one best-selling book on American politics called America Rules, a book that Guy Gardner is particularly fond of, as it is mostly pictures with only 32 pages. Someone tries to assassinate Etrigan, which of course fails, only managing to aggravate the demon, who goes after his assailant, planning to kill him. But then, Superman intervenes. Etrigan and Superman begin fighting pretty evenly at first, and Superman berates Etrigan, calling him the worst candidate for public office that he has ever seen, saying that the public will eventually see him for what he is, and that they will take care of him. After which, Superman promptly wins the fight. After getting his ass beat by Superman, Etrigan is still confident that he can win the presidency, and intentionally misquotes Superman, saying that the Man of Steel is a trusted advisor and close personal friend of Etrigan. 
Superman, in response, gives a big speech about how he can protect them from natural disasters, but he can't protect them from themselves. Only they can do that. Etrigan doesn't seem worried about this, however, and kills his entire body of political staff so he can continue his endeavour to become president. With the presidency, Etrigan plans to destroy all of creation and possess the Godhead, which he reveals was his intention all along. Which I don't know how he's going to do that with the American presidency, but whatever. However, thanks to his secretary teaming up with Jason, they are able to use the poem to turn Etrigan back into Jason, forcing him out of the race for presidency. His secretary then gives a speech about how Etrigan plans to drop out with the statement, My work here is all but done. I ask your help. Observe. If drafted, I won't run. If elected, I won't serve. Later, we see Jason travel to an island owned by someone called Ex Nihilo, who shows him the Black Diamond of Eclipso, telling him that Eclipso is vengeance and that he has cursed Ex Nihilo with immortality, and so he wants Etrigan to kill him. He also warns them, saying that all the signs say that Eclipso will return soon. He says Eclipso's power makes Merlin's strength look like a babe in arms which is definitely Cap, but whatever, and as he says this, he captures Jason, saying that only Etrigan has the power to kill him. However, it's too late, as Clarion has already stolen the Black Diamond, becoming possessed by Eclipso and attacking Ex Nihilo. Jason transforms into Etrigan and begins fighting the Eclipsed Clarion, doing extremely well against him, seeming to clearly have the upper hand. The fight continues with Eclipse Clarion saying that only solar energy can truly destroy him, taking the advantage in the fight and restraining Etrigan. Harry the Pillow claims that even with some magic that he picked up from Belial, he wouldn't even put a dent in Eclipso, and that they need solar energy to defeat him, which is probably why Ex Nihilo thinks Eclipso is so much more powerful than Merlin, because he can only be defeated by sunlight. Harry realizes that a physical assault with his magic won't work, and so instead attacks Eclipso mentally, using his magic to make him believe that the sun is rising, causing Eclipso to flee in Clarion's body. In Gotham, we see Astaroth, Tweedledee, and Tweedledum, with Astaroth saying that now that they have been kicked out of hell, he plans to become a Gotham crime boss instead. Elsewhere, we see that Harry is still unhappy about his existence as a pillow, for some reason, and seeing this, Jason decides that he wants to help Harry. But Jason can't fix it on his own, and sends out a signal for aid. Etrigan goes looking for Merlin's Eternity Book to help him with this, but doesn't find it where it's supposed to be, with it being stated that the janitor is in possession of it. The only person to receive this message for aid sent by Jason is Lobo, who views it as a veiled threat that Etrigan could kick his ass, and so he decides to go and show him what he's made of. Jason is able to find the janitor who has been using the book to make a whole harem of Wonder Woman clones that he unleashes on Etrigan as he transforms. Of course, even this giant horde of Wonder Women is no match for Etrigan and are easily defeated by him. After this, he goes on to directly fight the janitor, who he kills by absorbing all of the mystic power from him and then feeding it back, immediately overloading him, and making the janitor explode. Astaroth, who has been watching, steps in and picks up the Book of Eternity, saying that he will add the power of Merlin's book to his own and take revenge on Etrigan. However, it's at this exact moment that Lobo shows up, and just suddenly picks a fight with Astaroth, catching him off guard, but is quickly overpowered after this. Astaroth, Etrigan, and Lobo get into a three-way brawl during which Astaroth slips away, leaving the book behind, saying that he was drunk and his wits were slowed, which is the only reason Lobo got the drop on him at all. Etrigan and Lobo continue fighting, repeatedly stalemating just like they did last time. 
Eventually the fighting stops, however, and Etrigan tells Lobo that he should come with him to Hell, as there are tougher opponents there that he will enjoy fighting. Lobo agrees, and whilst they are in Hell, they run into Morax, an old ally of Etrigan, and the demon that now possesses Astaroth's power. Morax tells them that Hell sucks a lot more than it usually does, and decides to help Etrigan as they head out to confront Belial. Belial is aware of their arrival, however, calling the group his bastard son and his dudes. We see Belial's advisor, Muk Awfully Cutekin, who is definitely absolutely not Merlin in disguise, saying that he foretold that this would happen and that they will keep the terms of their bargain so long as the Ark Demon plays his part. They finally meet with Belial, who says that he will give them Harry's soul in return for the Ark Demon's heart that Etrigan tore out before, which is stored in the impenetrable fortress of Flynn. Belial asks Etrigan why he's doing this and what exactly is in it for him, and Etrigan says that virtue is its own reward. After reaching the fort and breaking in, they find the thing who cannot die there, who has, to their dismay, eaten Belial's heart. Fortunately, however, they still have Merlin's book, which they decide to use to create a new heart for Belial. As they are in the process of doing this, Remiel and Duma, the current rulers of Hell, which does not please Etrigan at all, who begins to attack them. After Etrigan and his team have been fighting these angels for a while, not really having much success against the Holy Duo because of their purity and ability to heal themselves, Duma and Remiel decide they don't have the patience for this anymore and freeze them all in place so they could fly away. After this, Lobo and Morax question Etrigan's intentions, who says that he is helping because he gave Harry his word. Neither of them are particularly convinced, however, wondering if this is simply part of some grander scheme. Etrigan then claims that he knows that one of Belial's death squads is coming for them. Belial and Merlin are discussing with each other, with the wizard saying that the death squad they sent out definitely won't be coming back, but that they shouldn't worry as Merlin has a plan, and that he will either destroy or capture his brother Etrigan. As they are on their way back, Etrigan begins preparing some precautionary magic saying that when dealing with someone like his father, it is best to do so. Once they return to Belial, Etrigan gives him this new fabricated heart, and Belial returns Harry's soul back to him, which literally does nothing and he remains a pillow. Belial apologizes, saying that he's sorry, but that he just couldn't resist, and that Harry will be a pillow forever, causing everyone to laugh at him. The celebration is cut short, as Etrigan tries to use the Book of Eternity on Belial, however, it instead only manages to kill him thanks to a booby trap that was laid there by Merlin, as he and Belial had predicted this would happen. After which, they hold a funeral for Etrigan, but the thing that cannot die is upset, as he thinks Etrigan does not deserve to die like this, and attacks Merlin. Thanks to Belial's heart, which he ate earlier, he is actually quite a formidable opponent. Belial tries to intervene in the battle, but Etrigan shows up out of nowhere, crashing into Belial in his hell car, simultaneously shooting a blast at Merlin. Etrigan reveals that what they saw earlier was nothing but a magical duplicate created when he cast the precautionary magics. Etrigan and Merlin get into a clash of magic and seem evenly matched at first, but Etrigan begins to overpower him, eventually winning. Etrigan says that he knew Merlin would try to betray him like this, which is why he took these precautions, and they all jump on Belial, tearing out his new heart, with Etrigan saying that he will now bury them in the grave they planned to bury him in. They then place Merlin into Belial's chest cavity, sealing it closed, and burying them both together, celebrating and then leaving Hell. We are shown a flashback where, in the process of making a deal with someone, Etrigan was able to pull the soul out of someone else for payment. He then later fulfills the deal, resurrecting an entire horde of the undead in exchange, which is presumably something he can just do, independent of any deals. We see Jason relaxing, but in his mind, 
Etrigan is communicating with him, and he seems to be upset about something. He doesn't like that Ashtaroth is still out there and wants to find and kill him. At the same time, we cut to Remiel and Duma who seem to be mid-conversation. Remiel says that Ashtaroth is going to wipe the floor with them. Duma seems to sign something to Remiel, who replies that Etrigan is probably going to mess it up, but that he knows he will jump at the offer. Etrigan manages to find Ashtaroth, but the Archfiend is surprisingly prepared for him, and has allied himself with Choirboy Commandos. They assault Etrigan with a variety of holy weapons, even including things like holy water and holy music, but it's not enough to put the demon down, and he is able to escape. Etrigan returns to Hell, and is approached by Remiel and Duma, who ask him to take on the role of Hell's hitman, and that they want him to assassinate Astaroth. Etrigan, of course, accepts this offer gleefully. He decides to prepare for his job as Hell's Hitman by approaching and teaming up with the hero Hitman because of his expertise with just that. Hitman has a lot of experience fighting demons like the Morsir, so he makes for a valuable ally. In the meantime, Astaroth is planning a cult ritual to summon something known as the Gotho Demon, and that they only need one more murder to complete the ritual. Etrigan and Hitman manage to locate Astaroth, but by the time they arrive, it's too late, and the final murder has been committed, and the Gotho Demon summoned into reality. Etrigan states that the Gotho Demon is an entity born with all of the hate and fear present in Gotham throughout the years. Etrigan tries to fight the demon by simply jumping into it, but this proves to be a bad idea, as it severely injures him, pulling Etrigan inside of it. The Gotho Demon states that 500 years ago, the first citizen that came here killed his wife, and it was born. It has had half a millennium to build up its power, and Etrigan is nothing to him. Etrigan scoffs at this, saying that 500 years of feeding on the fear and hate of humanity is meaningless. That it is chicken feed to him, as he has been around for a hundred thousand years or more, and has given up counting after which he easily one-shots the Gotho Demon from the inside using a huge gout of his demonic fire. Astaroth is finally defeated, and Etrigan finishes the job by killing him, sending Astaroth back to Hell, where we see Remiel and Duma reset his status to Janitor. We see that Etrigan is back in Hell, and a demon approaches him saying that his partner, Lady Smegma, is going into labour. However, she seems to be having trouble, and Etrigan is forced to make an Etrigan-style surgery on her for the baby to be born. A human is able to observe this child, describing it as a nightmare, a disgusting thing constantly changing, shifting, warping, and unfolding from inside itself, the sight of which was enough to make him instantly throw up. In the company of the legendary Bator, Etrigan is approached by yet another demon, who says that everyone living in Bator's kingdom has decided to leave because they are tired of dealing with Bator's nonsense, but that he is the one remaining loyal subject. Etrigan decides to reward him for this by taking him down to the basement where he feeds the demon to his newly born son. We see a flashback to Merlin pulling himself from Belial's chest cavity, crawling out into hell, recalling when the Great Darkness had originally arrived in Hell, as we saw in Swamp Thing Volume 2. It left behind the Sunless Sea, which all the denizens of Hell fear, as all who have entered it have never returned. Whilst near the Sunless Sea, Merlin observed Lady Smegma and Etrigan enter the waters of the Sunless Sea, where they consummate the child I have already spoken of. Merlin warns Jason of this cursed event, telling him that a part of the Great Darkness has become infused with the child, and that Etrigan cannot hope to control its power, and that Etrigan hopes to unleash this ungodly abomination upon the Earth. Jason procures the help of Hitman, Harry, Merlin, and the Thing That Cannot Die, but during this meeting, Etrigan swaps places with Jason and taunts the group outrageously. 
Once he swaps back, Merlin tells them that Etrigan knows everything that they know, and that he is laughing at them, as he knows they cannot stop him. We later found out that Merlin was actually helping Etrigan the entire time, that he was setting up the necessary ritual for Etrigan's son to come through to the Earth, unbeknownst to Jason and the others. Merlin attempts to fight them, but is immediately killed by Hitman as he has no magic left whatsoever. This fails to stop the spell, however, and the unholy spawn of demon and darkness, known as Golgotha, finally appears on Earth. As a forewarning to this next arc, I'm just going to say that many people have tried to, putting it nicely, criticize me for how I have described this next arc involving Etrigan's son, telling me that the entire story takes place inside of Jason's mind. Now unfortunately for them, I actually read the comic, so I know how ridiculous this is, and I will make it clear, as I go, exactly how. In an attempt to stop Golgotha, Jason uses the same magic binding Etrigan to himself in combination with the portal, bringing Golgotha to the Earth to instead send Golgotha to his mind, much like Etrigan. Both Etrigan and Glenda tell him not to do this because his soul and mind will be torn apart by the effort, as Etrigan is already connected to him. But he does it anyway. Now bear in mind that earlier in this exact same arc, we see that when Jason recites the poem and Etrigan is sucked into him, he is quite literally directly sent to hell, and this is when he originally gets the deal from Remiel and Duma to kill Astaroth. So I guess Remiel and Duma are also locked inside of Jason's mind? Not only this, but directly following this, Etrigan returns to hell for the birth of Golgotha in the same manner. So clearly, Bator, Lady Smegma, and literally the Great Evil Beast must also all be a part of Jason's mind, right along with the entirety of Hell. Look, I respect my boy Jason, but I don't think he literally contains all of Hell, including several angels, Merlin, and an embodiment of the darkness so dangerous it threatened the presence himself inside of his head. In fact, following this logic, almost all of Volume 3 must have taken place inside of Jason's head. So when Etrigan directly states that he and Golgotha travel from Jason's mind to Hell, it is completely and utterly literal, and not some weird fantasy dream landscape Hell contained within Jason's mind. Etrigan and Golgotha scrap in Hell for a time, with his son clearly holding the advantage, as it's mainly Etrigan's demonic regeneration keeping him in the fight. Etrigan states that their fight is so fierce that Hell itself can no longer contain it, and they fly out of it. This leads them to the Gates of Heaven, where they are approached by the Doorkeep of Heaven, who is promptly one-shot by Golgotha as Etrigan looks on in dismay, exclaiming that he has spilled angel blood and that he hastens the apocalypse. I have said in the past that this angel was Michael, which I'm still going to stand by for several reasons. Firstly, Michael has been repeatedly shown to be the doorkeep of heaven, that is, his literal job, and every time someone goes there, Michael is waiting for them. The only argument against this I have ever seen is that Michael was chained up at this time, but these people fail to realize that Lucifer Volume 1 happens not long after the events of Sandman. As we can see with the state of affairs in Hell, the Demon Volume 3 clearly takes place after Michael has been released from his captivity, just like he shows up in Spectre Volume 3, which is literally a tie-in to this comic and came out at the same time. But what do I know? Hey, I only actually read the comics. Clearly, really what I should be doing is just randomly taking arguments completely out of my ass with no basis whatsoever, making a fool of myself in the process. I'm sure that would be far superior to actually reading the comic to see what happens. Anyway, enough of my bitching. Etrigan continues to get mauled by Golgotha, but he is approached by Jason, who says that he will give Etrigan the power to defeat Golgotha by using the binding that already exists between them. However, he will only do this in return for Etrigan begging for his help, and in addition by giving his heart to Jason which Etrigan agrees to do. 
Etrigan then uses this power to reluctantly finish off his son Golgotha once and for all, finally stopping his destruction. Etrigan then says that he has Etrigan's heart in a safe place and that he is happy that he got to hear Etrigan beg. Next, in heaven, we see Carrion, the Archangel of War, stating that Remiel and Duma are dumbasses, completely incompetent at running hell. That Clarion wants to see a more reliable hell, and they shall storm and take control of it in the name of heaven. And it seems as if the rest of the angelic host agrees with him. At the same time, we see Etrigan in hell completely unmotivated and seemingly depressed which is either a result of Jason taking his heart, or more interestingly, in my opinion, the fact that he was forced to kill his son, Golgotha. Two demons spot Carrion approaching with his army, with one of the demons saying that he brings half of the angelic host with him to battle. As the army approaches, we see what is left of Hell's best forces marshalling themselves for a defense, which includes Morax, Cac, Bloodcot, Poppin J and the legendary Bator, Lord of the Criminally Insane. They go to Etrigan, who still seems unmotivated to do anything or help in any way. This angers the four of them, including Bator, who gang up and attack Etrigan, calling him a chicken, but unfortunately for them, they are no match, even combined for Etrigan's power, and he promptly one-shots all of them. After defeating all of them, Etrigan gains a newfound inspiration, gathering up the rest of Hell's demons to face off against Carrion's army. Etrigan and his army are able to take on and kill many, many angels, with Carrion stating that Etrigan is no threat, but that he is by far the strongest amongst them. Etrigan goes to directly confront Carrion and is clearly able to put the hurt on him, but is eventually taken down by the angel's fiery sword. Etrigan escapes from the battle and is given time to recuperate, where after seeing the ghosts of his fallen comrades, he is reinvigorated yet again, and he stumbles upon the crown of horns. Placing the crown of horns atop his head, he goes to confront Carrion again. Carrion attempts to fight Etrigan once again, but the demon is able to easily catch his sword in one hand, immediately tearing his arm off and easily defeating him with his hellfire, thanks to his newfound rigor and power boost from the Crown of Horns. In the aftermath of the battle, Etrigan leaves and the rest of the angelic host leaves as well, knowing that the battle is over. However, the Crown of Horns is left behind, and Bator is encouraged by the other demons to wear it, making him the new King of Hell. With Bator giving a rousing speech that for once is something other than just an announcement of his name. He says, Oh my beloved ice cream bar, how I love to lick your creamy center and your oh so nutty chocolate coloring. I am Bator, which elicits a huge cry of joy from the rest of the crowd of demons. So in the end, Carrion got the exact opposite of what he wanted when he decided to invade Hell. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed. I'm still working on my Parallax video, which will hopefully come out soon. Yes, I still want to do the Trigon video, but as I've said several times already, I'm waiting for certain comic lines that include the character to conclude before I cover him, because I don't want to miss out on stuff that is currently coming out. Anyway, I will see you all in the next one.